this is the examination request. Jessica, is this what they sent you? This thing that looked like this? Yeah. Okay. Good. So this is the sort of the let me see if I can get it to scoot up or down or something. I can't get it to move. I don't know that you're going to be able to. I'm sharing an application that's on my desktop right now, Doc. Okay. So if you could just let me know what you needed to do, and I'll move it around. Otherwise, you're going to have to open it on your desk. Oh, okay. So just oh, I didn't know I could do that and show it. I didn't know that. Can, can oh we yeah, do that? we can. We can do just about anything, Doc. You let me know in advance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll have to remember that. Uh, all right. So let's make it a little smaller. Can you shrink it down just a hair? I think the size is in the center, so it's 52.9. Bring it down a bit. OK, good. Now, and then you can just go to the next page. That's yeah, perfect right there. And just go to the next page. And it kind of gives you the kind of the whole history and all of this stuff and the importance of the PEP, blah, 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 blah. Go ahead, next. And what you have to do, what's it covering, what you have to have is up here, what's the PEP all about. This is going to be updated because they have 11 categories now. And they've changed the titles of some of these things. Okay, Next. And then this is the cost factor. And then they tell you what you can do if you have disabilities, what they can do to modify that kind of thing. This is a standard application that they're sending out. Okay, and Next. Oh, go back. Excuse me. So if you're an APA member, you paid 325 and if you're a non-member, you pay three ninety-five. Well, since it costs around four hundred dollars to be a PEP, APA member, it doesn't seem like a great bargain to sign up for as an APA member. I'm an APA member; I've always been, but it, I couldn't use that as a justification for joining as a member. I would probably make that a whole lot higher if I could, just to try to see if they become a member. That kind of money isn't worth bothering with. All right, go ahead to the next one. And then you fill this out, and I think you have to swear to, you know, that everything is true and accurate for fear of losing your head, so to speak. Next. And then uh, this is just uh, some information that you have to agree to. Go ahead. And this has all got to be notarized. Here's a waiver of acknowledgment. So it's a big legal contract. I'm not sure why take the test, but you have to go through this application process. OK, one more. I think there's a couple more. Same idea. This is uh, you know, the application fee payment form. They have a separate form for the payment. Um, go ahead. Um, let's see. This is verification of provisional health services. Uh, so this is, uh, I think this is for. This this piece right here, this verification of provision of health service, is some some states uh, have mixtures of psychologists licensed, and so they want to know that this is a health healthcare provider, so to speak. All right, I think that's what that's about. And then the next one, in psychopharmacology, didactic education, so you have to point out everything that you took, and I think there's an a, they're actually asking your cases, I mean your uh, courses, which courses you took, blah, 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 blah. Go ahead, next one. Yeah, here's where you list out all your courses and the categories you have to meet. So if you have any trouble with any of this, any of the major training programs, there should be no trouble with filling this out. In the beginning, there was some trouble because the, the exact names weren't lining up completely, but now that I think the schools have all corrected that problem. OK, well, I think we just got a couple more. Oh, that's the back side. One more, I think. That's it. Yeah. So that's the application itself that you apply for. And you can get that online. But since they made the change, you're going to probably have to get the more current version of it. OK? Although, Jessica, you sent off your application, is that correct, using the old one? Is that true? You did some of PEP3 did as well. Uh, it is prep docs uh, for the course in the prep docs uh, for this course. Okay, I used the old one. 
but it's uh, fairly similar, good. Okay, I have the old one just downloaded yesterday, and they just uh, gave you a call. What? They just, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, good. Good. So we'll go over the categories, and then we'll kind of talk. I, I just put in sample questions. Some of the sample questions come from lots of different places. Some of them I tried to make up as I went. Um, they're, they're okay. Uh, they at least get you thinking, and that's, that's the whole idea here. Okay. Capstone, so what is a capstone? That's a performance-based criteria that they were trying to work on to establish. It's not capstone, it's capstone experience. It's not capstone, <laughs> it's capstone experience, okay. Can you talk more about it? It's not a name, right? I got it. But it's about more experiential evidence of performing competencies, as I recall. This is, I went to APA for a big meeting about this about maybe five years ago. So I hadn't heard anything after a while. It sort of disappeared and fell off the map, and apparently it, it has, and they're looking at other ways. But it's the idea that, that you have to be able to demonstrate certain skills in your preceptorship or practicum. Well, that, that is a fundamental problem right there. So New Jersey law requires that this requires this for and it requires this for the masters. So the New Jersey law requires, that's currently written, and FDU developed its own exam. So you're telling me they're not doing the PEP anymore? Is that true? Military requires the PEP, right? And I think it's part of the New Jersey law. No, it's not FDU exam. Not required for the degree. FDU has an alternative to the PEP to graduate. Okay, so that's just an alternative exam, okay, as opposed to having to take the PEP. But it's one of those exams, correct? So it's a PEP or exit exam. Okay. It's an online comprehensive exam. Who made up? Who made it up? I was unaware we had a choice. Uh, I will have to ask. Okay. Well, if you're going to take one exam over the other, I would do the PEP just because it might turn out to be um, advantageous for you down the road, just depending where you live. Um, okay. 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 So integrating. Clinical psychopharmacology at the practice of psychology. Wait, is that something else going on? Let's go down to comprehensive exam. Okay. This refers to the implementation of clinical practices of biopsychosocial assessment, multiaxial diagnosis, and treatment, including pharmacotherapy, in the context of complex of a complex of factors influencing functioning. These factors include biological, for example, genetics, sex, age, disease, disability, psychological, for example, cognitive, emotional, dynamic, motivational, behavioral, psychosocial, for example, gender, cultural, ethnic, interpersonal, and ecological, environmental factors. You're going, to, um, the cultural ethnic issue is one, one of the major changes in this uh, process. Um, this was always here before, but it's becoming more of an issue. Um, DSM, DSM-5 is uh, soon, oh, okay. I, they're not going to, if you're worried about the DSM-5 over the 4, I don't think that's going to be an issue because they're, they're not sticklers on that uh, system anyway. The questions are not like that. Okay, so this is category one within this first section. Okay, so this is the very first content area, integrating clinical psychopharmacology with practice of 
psychology, and then this is a subcategory, 0, 1 being the first, and then the first one within the first. So we've got biopsychosocial variables uh, that uh, as determinants of medication effects, for example, age, gender, family history, patient belief systems, economics, social support, current environmental circumstances. So the, here's the question. Try not to look at the answer. It's there. I wish I could block it out. Maybe I can. I don't know. Let's see if I can find it out. Now that doesn't block it out, does it? Does it block it out when I do that? Yes, no. Yeah, it does. Kinda. <laughs> that's right, kinda. That's what I thought. Maybe I could cover it up with this. I got another thing that might do it. That's a happy face. Yeah, that might do it, right? Okay, we could do that. Because I want you to just try these things. Okay. So the biopsychosocial bio predictors of response to a particular medication might include all of the following. So this is one of those negative ones. Except patients past response same or similar medication, family members' response to similar medication, a therapist's uh, school of thought, the relative cost of the medication to the patient, the ability to pay, the patient's social support, and environmental stability. Okay. I mean, what, what was your natural inclination? Without, without looking at the answer, what would, what would have been your answer? Everybody's going to pick C now. I know you all had a peak. <laughs> okay, you would have you would have chosen that. That makes sense. Okay, great. Too easy, exactly. Some of these are. Some of them you will disagree with. Uh -huh. See, it's it's not going to let me do that. Okay. Um. Okay, knowledge of relative effects of psychological, psychopharmacological and psychological interventions as sole additive or interactive treatments for given uh, disorders. So combine medication and psychotherapy. Treatment is likely to be optimum for which of the following conditions? Okay, bipolar, smoking, smoky cessation, substance abuse, anxiety, phobia, mania, Acute agitation, dysthymia, personality disorders. So this is a combined medication psychotherapy treatment. Which of the conditions is it most likely to be optimal for? A, B. According to this, it's A. Yes, it's possible to overthink some of the answers. Yep. I like B, but I think it's A. It's A. Do you need, you know, do you need uh, medication for treatment of a phobia necessarily? No, you don't. Right? Right. So it's saying likely to be optimal for which of the following. That's not necessary for a phobia. Right? Uh, substance abuse uh, seems contradictory for medication, but I think, right, and abuse could be possibility, um, right. Um, there's also, uh, they're not telling you which substance, right? So it could be alcohol, right? But it could be an opiate dependency where you have Suboxone. There is, there's always room to debate, but unfortunately, one's going to be more right than the other. That's the way it's going to turn out. <clears throat> and you're going to have that experience when you're taking the PEP. I agree with PEP PEP 20. What's PEP PEP 20 saying? Where are you? Is there room to debate? Yes, there is. But you could overthink it. So you have to make a choice, so do the best you can. You're not going to get them all right. Okay? And if you can live with that, you'll be fine. Except you can't debate the computer. That's absolutely right. Exactly right. D and D best for treatment alone. C is best for treatment alone. Okay. 
these kind of these are I, I call these irritating questions because there isn't clear evidence one way or the other when you're thinking about it. But you have to make your best choice. Knowledge of relative effects of psychopharmacological and psychological interventions as sole additive, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The use of benzodiazepines is not generally is not generally indicated in exposure therapy for phobia, alcohol withdrawal, medication induced dystonia, acute stress response. I mean everybody knows it's A, right? Because they left it wide open, right? Do you think that's always true? Did you debate that answer? Some are, some are not, in the same degree of difficulty. Benzos would defeat the exposure. Yeah. What's the dystonia? That's an EPS condition where you have a, you know, extreme tone, distant, some problems with, um, you, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of it. Everybody knows generally what EPS is, right? You can get the echesthesia, the dystonia is muscle tone di disorders. Uh, you can get tremors, those types of things, okay? And medication-induced dystonia would be associated with um, what? Anybody know? Yeah, like muscle contractions, essentially. You can get very severe dystonia, like uh, um, basically where your neck is wrenching around, turning in one direction, that type of thing. You can get severe muscle spasms in the upper back and neck area. They're really like large muscle contractions. Um, but the idea of medication-induced dystonia is more commonly associated with what class of medicines? Antipsychotics, thank you. Antipsychotics, right? And in theory, um, it's going to be worse with the first generation, and the second generation should be a little better, right? In theory. Um, so, while the evidence is less compelling in mild or acute forms, which following diagnosis is best treated by combination, psychotherapy and medication in its chronic form? So that's the key, in its chronic form. Yes, okay. Now, you know there's controversy about what to do with the severe depression versus uh, a mild depression, major depression, in terms of the role of psychotherapy, whether it has value or not. People, there's still controversy about this. It's not completely settled. I think some people think it's settled, but it's not. There's studies that contra contradict each other. So a recent study that uh, came out uh, that suggested that medication, you know, the, most of the psychiatrists believe this. You give medication absolutely for severe depression. And I think everybody would agree with that. And even I have psychologists that I see that come in with severe depression, and they want to be on medication, right? But in terms of long-term benefit, it probably is true that therapy helps and is more effective. But it's also time-consuming, and it's also very expensive. I mean, you don't, you don't get well quickly. Sometimes, and you will see this when you start prescribing, the medicine really does work. It's not all bad. Um, and sometimes you can really get a, a remarkable response, especially when somebody is presenting with very severe depression. And most of my patients uh, have already had psychotherapy many times. Um, and they have a remitting disorder. Um, I mean, uh, not a remitting, um, the other way around. They have a recurrent illness that just doesn't go away completely. And even sometimes meds fail significantly when you try to help them. 
But I believe that therapy is important, but in the nature of your work, you may not have as much time because you may find you're seeing sicker people and handling other types of disease entities than you, you are used to. And in that way, you end up doing a little work like a psychiatrist in a way. But I think our approach to the communication with patients, I think psychologists and generally, they generally handle that differently. Not all, not everybody. But I think most psychologists are relatively aware of the role of therapy, and they try to, even if you can't see the patient as regularly, you're always going to try to do something along those lines to help them. Um, but there are controversies about that, and it's not completely settled. So you probably, a takeaway message about this category here is generally they want you to include psychotherapy, OK? And where it seems to be justified, you want to do that. That's just generally a take home thing. That, that there's a favor, there's a feeling that they really want you to pay attention to that, OK? They think that's a very important component of treatment. And that is true. OK, what is this? Psychotherapy, in general, psychotherapy is less effective as a single modality than, psycho than pharmacotherapy when treated chronic depression with access to disorder. Uh, pharmacotherapy is less effective as single modality approach than psychotherapy when treating chronic uh, depression with an access to disorder. There is no difference between psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy as a single modality treatment for chronic depression with access to disorder. Combination therapy should always be used when treating depression. Okay, and the answer is B according to this, right? Okay, anybody have any issues with that? Meds are better than therapy alone? Sometimes. It's not, a, it, that is true sometimes. Not always, but in general, it's, it's, it happens. And, you know, if you have somebody that, like a bipolar patient, not a not a two, but a one, you know, therapy is going to help them, but you really, your, your real lion share of work is going to be getting something that controls that severe mood disorder. And that's always complicated. It's not quite like you can just give them one thing. So as you do this and as you see more pathology, you're going to do be you're going to find yourself using multiple meds. It just happens. Because oftentimes one med is not sufficient. And I'm talking about more severe disorders. I'm not talking about some mild depression or even moderate depression. I'm talking about you know a very severe mood disorder. Can't really can't really medicate an axis two. That's right. I don't think there's good evidence for that. But I, th I know that some of that is being done. Um, dialectic behavior therapy, but other personality disorders are long-term and need support. No real meds. Agree with that. And I think that's a general thing you could say, safely. I think everybody would agree with that. Right? Nobody's, nobody's arguing that. Right? Good. So we go on to the next one. OK, and treat this is. Limitations, this is a new category. Limitations and benefits, patients' perception and treatment expectations regarding psychopharmacological and psychological interventions as sole additive or interactive treatments for a given disorder and functional impairments. In the treatment of OCD, what do we got here? Somebody already answered, D. <laughs> okay, research indicates that single treatment modality behavioral therapy is more effective than combination treatment modality when symptoms are primarily compulsive. Uh, research uh, indicates that combined treatment modality medication, behavioral therapy, is more effective than single treatment modality when symptoms are primarily obsessive. Research cannot provide any direction regarding the choice of single or combined modality treatment. So they're saying, and everyone here is saying, both A and B are correct. Right? Everybody's in agreement with that? OK, good. Yeah, exposure and response prevention is really what it is for OCD. 
He said this is a new category. No, the, this is a new section within the category. Okay. I'm just the, you know, remember I told you there's a there's a main category one, and then there is a subcategory under it. Okay. So we go on. So we have thousands of questions for you to be able to look at. Okay. Um, Limitations and benefits, patients, perception and treatment, same category because we're, not, we're 01, 02. A patient's preference for an anxiolytic to address anxiety symptoms associated with depression. A patient's preference for an anxiolytic to address anxiety symptoms associated with depression is a minor factor but needs to be considered in treatment choice is a significant factor when selecting treatment should be overruled if research suggests a more effective treatment, both A and C. Now what do you all think? We Okay, we only have a couple of minutes. Um, what's the issue here, obviously? Anything? Well, B is the answer. We know that. But why? Patient compliance, that's a good one. Okay. Um, there's a patient preference. If you disagree with them, you, you really have to provide them with a rational reason why that would not work, right? Um, the patient's motivation is if the patient feels that you've heard what their request is and you understand it and you think it's reasonable, they're more likely to be compliant, they're going to be more satisfied with the treatment. That's a nice little placebo effect. That's correct. Okay. Uh, impact of belief on efficacy is very, very important. Okay. Okay, Tony, but check the prescription monitoring program. <laughs> yeah, Tony's talking about the PMP is something unique here in Louisiana. Uh, I don't know how many states have it, but when we got it here, it was only number uh, five. We were, I think, the fourth in the country to get it. And basically what it does is it takes every controlled substance a person who lives in Louisiana who fills a prescription for a controlled substance, it gets sent to a central pharmacy, and if you're a, if you're a prescribing psychologist, a medical psychologist as we call it here, um, you basically can um, look at every controlled substance that person has been taking since early 2008. And it gives you the information of what particular thing they got, what was the dosage, how many they got, how long was that supposed to last, what was the date of the prescription when it was, was ordered, and what's the date of the prescription when it was filled, who the provider was, okay, and what pharmacy they went to. So you get a great deal of information. And it's a great way to catch double dippers, because you're going to see that. It's a great way to catch people who are um, using your um, prescriptions illegally because that's going to happen to you. You'll probably get that experience sometime down the road. I had somebody writing, I guess it was uh, Adderall for him and his wife for a year and a half. And they went to four different pharmacies on the weekend to get pills and they were selling it. Um, and I never, no one ever alerted me, no one ever told me. When pharmacists finally contacted me, and then I got on the uh, PMP and I could see all of the prescriptions that they had filled over that period of time. It was incredible, incredible. They had a nice deal going on, I think. I'm not in trouble for their fraud, but uh, they were in trouble. But the police weren't going to do anything about it. That's the sad part. OK, but the question does say to address anxiety symptoms. So the patient's preference for an anxiolytic to address anxiety symptoms. And when we say anxiolytic, we typically mean what? A benzo, yes. Yes, a benzo, right? And there is a bit of a problem, right? Because we learned that sometimes benzos, particularly, particularly a benzo with somebody who's depressed, could be a potential issue, right? Because we were taught that benzodiazepines can exacerbate depression, right? Everybody's heard that. I'm sure you've heard that, right? Yeah, OK. So that's kind of a funky question in that regard. And what is this? Risk of overdose 
in suicide. Yeah, it depends on what you give them and how much you give them. I mean, it's not like you have to give them a loaded gun. Okay, the answer is D, and all comments are important to consider as to a significant factor. Okay, some SSRIs have sedating effects. That is true, right? But that's not that's near, nearly not the that's not the question. Yeah. Uh, and with alcohol, right? You can o you can OD with alcohol. You can OD if you're taking an opiate. But there's I don't really have that problem. I haven't really seen that problem. For me, I know people abuse drugs like Xanax in particular. Clonazepam is less likely to be abused. But Xanax is terrible for some people. It's like giving them, you know, uh, some terrible addictive drug that they just start loving and they start uh, going up on higher and higher doses. I have a patient, person was, I inherited this patient, 12 milligrams. Xanax a day. Ever hear of such a thing? <laughs> this is God honest truth, man. I inherited that patient. And and I tried to get him into a rehab and nobody wanted to touch him with a ten foot pole. Because they know that there's a high risk of seizures and he's having significant breakthrough anxiety. So how do you what do you do? What do you do with that? What do you do? Yep terrible rebound. Okay. So he ends up taking it like every two hours. Okay. Your problem with detox is you can't just stop. You're going to get a huge, you're going to have a seizure. And that's more deadly than him being on the Alprazolam. He's miserable on the Alprazolam, but, but we can handle it. And so we switch over with equal titration with uh, clonazepam. So you switch him to clonazepam. That's what I did. And that's the way you do it. And then you back down. That's how you do it. Switch to a longer acting benzo. And the favorite for that purpose is clonazepam. That's the one that you typically use. OK. I think we're supposed to stop here in a couple of minutes. Um, so these are just questions. And, 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 and it's not important that you answer every question correctly. It's just to get you thinking about it. How do you, how do you think about this? What do you need to go through when you're, when you're kind of assessing the correct response? You have answers to your last four PowerPoint test questions. My last four. Oh, the answers should be in there. The answers are all there. They should be there. If you go to those, you're talking about those other uh, questions and answers. Uh, yes, they're there. The answers are there. They should be there. OK? So th that's kind of fun stuff to do for yourself, that you start uh, actually looking at these things, trying to figure out how to answer them. And you really should, you know, tonight you can start going through these, or we can finish them up tomorrow and then go into some other things. I'm mean, not tomorrow, but uh, on Sunday we have more time together. Uh, so just I'm just trying to get you to be aware of what the PEP is like, start thinking about items, and then I want you to get into the cheat sheet, which I'll give you on uh, Sunday.